G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. As the trade period wears on, uh, I thought it would be a good time to take a look at trades that happened 12 months ago and go team by team and, and rank them into a tier list based on the outcomes of last year's trade period with a year now to reflect on exactly what happened because you can make judgments in real time about how trades are rated and who got better value but now we have a year under our belts we obviously don't have conclusive answers on most of these trades but we have a bit of insight as to how some of these deals went down and you also factor in little things like future picks being traded you can sort of get a feel for what value that really offered so for instance Collingwood's uh, trade for Lockie Schultz ended up being a really juicy pick Equally, a switch with Hawthorne for future seconds around Jack Ginevan. Um, yeah, Hawthorne ended up finishing higher than Collingwood this year. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through every team. I found a Fox Sports article where they, they really map out how every deal went down. We're just going to go through it together. And then we're going to grade how we thought each team went. So we can just read it through this together. Um, I hope it's easy enough to digest. But we're going to start with the Adelaide Crows. We'll go alphabetical. So there's a couple of ways to analyze this. Do we analyze them on the work that they did or we analyze it on outcomes? Maybe we should look at more of an outcome point of view. So for instance, getting an end of first round uh, compensation pick for Tom Doday. Do we give Adelaide credit for that? Probably not. It's really out of their hands as to what compensation they get. Uh, but I suppose if you look at the outcome, I suppose it's not too bad. Uh, further to that, they traded Burgess and pick 14, gave uh, Gold Coast some points, 23 and 26. And then they also got Melbourne's future second round pick, which we know now, a year on, is essentially a trade for Shane McAdam and Alex Neil Bull. And that was the value that Adelaide got from that. So how do we assess how Adelaide went overall? Now, Tom today did his ACL for Adelaide and then did it again at Brisbane, but we'll, we'll remove that. Um, I suppose you could say that they couldn't really have done much to keep Dode. If he wanted to leave, he wanted to leave. Now, what did they do with the value that they got out of this? Well, Burgess played, uh, I think, uh, seven games for seven goals. I, I looked it up right before recording this. In fact, none of these players actually had a lot of success. Burgess played uh, seven games. I think that's more, certainly more than Dode, who did his ACL, I think, in the preseason. And Shane McAdam also only played three games for Melbourne. So anyone attached to the Adelaide Crows last trade period didn't get on the park much. However, we do know that um, I think Adelaide pe packaged a couple of picks later to move up the draft to get Dan Curtin in last year's draft. So we do want to separate that a little bit. You know, we, we don't necessarily combine the trade and draft for this video. We can do that separately. I'll probably do a draft focus one uh, later on in the piece. However, what did Adelaide really get out of this? Well, they lost Tom Dode. That is a bit of a blow. Of course, he hasn't fired a shot yet for the Brisbane Lions, but he still probably has a decent career ahead of him. Uh, McAdam, given that they eventually get Neil Bullen, I don't think we consider that too much of a win or a loss. We'll see over time that one. As you can see here, I've got it A, a B, C, or D that we've got to rate the Crows in. So I'm not going to give anyone an F, so let's just say there's four tiers. Where do Adelaide sit into this? It'll probably make more sense. We can move around teams but I'm gonna say maybe a C you know I mean sure it helped them get the picks to acquire Dan Curtin um, that is also not part of the trade period strictly speaking uh, that being said on the outcomes they probably lost more than they'd gain without it being too much of a big deal they got decent compensation for Dode so I think all in all we'll start off with a C it's a little bit of an easy one to start we'll move now to the Brisbane Lions so we don't have to go far to now be discussing Tom Dode again. They got him as a restricted free agent. We know that he didn't really fire a shot because I think he did his ACL before the season started, if I'm remembering that correctly. So didn't play a game for the Brisbane Lions. Uh, there was also a deal for Tom Fullerton. Tom Fullerton didn't play a game for Brisbane. Um, and then there was this big messy deal here where Brandon Ryan got to Brisbane and uh, Jack Gunston went to the Hawthorne Football Club. All in all here for the Lions, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, do we give, we gotta give them some credit. I still think is a good player. So it would be very short-sighted to say, well, this trade period blew up in their faces because uh, Tom Dodo did his ACL because it's, you know, he's on a four-year contract, as you can see here. Overall, net in versus net out. Do we give the Brisbane Lions a B for that? Uh, again, it's probably a slow start to this video. I'm sure there's going to be some more juicy topics coming up. We've got the Hawks, we've got Collingwood, we've got Essendon. We're big players, but I think to start off, do we maybe we give them a B. There's not a whole lot of activity, but they did get a good player who's in the right age bracket for them and uh, will be important for a premiership defense going forward. Maybe a B because they get Tom Dode in.
Just a heads up guys, this video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Personally, I think the ability to talk to someone about what's going on inside your head may be the most underrated tool we have. Personally for me, I think one of the biggest benefits I get from verbalizing what's going on inside my head is that sometimes like thoughts or concerns that you have deep inside your mind kind of exist as these nebulous subconscious feelings. But when you actually say them out loud, when you actually have to articulate them into a sentence, there's plenty of times where I've found that that thought or concern that I had probably didn't actually make a lot of sense or was perhaps really irrational. And I didn't realize that until I had to formulate a sentence. So that's why I wanted to introduce today's paid partner, BetterHelp, because they're a platform that matches people with credentialed therapists who are trained to listen. The good thing about therapy is that it's a safe space. You know, there's no real fear of judgment. You get guarded help from an expert, an actual mental health trained professional. And I think people these days are really catching on to this idea that you don't need to be diagnosed with something like depression or anxiety to necessarily get a benefit from therapy. So if you want to get started in this process, you can go to the link in the description of this video, or you can simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. From there, you fill out a questionnaire, which helps them assess your specific needs. So it's easy to start and it's easy once you've started the process as well, because if you find a therapist that you perhaps don't feel like is the right fit for you, you can switch to another one at no additional cost. So if you're someone who thinks you could benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp, like I said, link in the description, or you can simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy, and that will get you 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. We moved to Carlton here now. So they offloaded a few pieces here. So Zach Fisher was one of them. He went to North Melbourne and had an okay year um, without being necessarily outstanding. That is a deal for uh, picks 21 and 25 come from North Melbourne and they get upgraded to 17 and get Zach Fisher. They also offloaded Paddy Dow to St. Kilda, who's had a decent year, but again, probably needed that, you know, shift in environment to be able to improve. And I think Paddy Dow, from what I understand, had a decent year at St. Kilda. So I don't think they missed those two players. Plus, Elijah Hollands, actually, this is a pretty good deal for Carlton. When you consider they upgraded 28 to 26 for the Gold Coast Suns, and a future fourth became a future third for the Suns as well. So really, a quite a cheap deal there for a guy who played, I think Hollands played 22 games. You average about 18 disposals a game and about 17 goals. Again, I did look that up. I'm not just some sort of genius, but I think he had a pretty successful first season. And with Fisher and Dow going out the door, I don't think those are two players that Carlton necessarily really missed this season. Sure, it wasn't a great year by the end of it, but I think Hollands did add a lot. So what do we say there? Not a whole lot of activity again from Carlton. I think all in all, maybe a B, I don't know. See, they were a little bit more active Adelaide than Adelaide. They they probably were a net profit because Elijah Hollands ended up having a good year. But did they do as good as Brisbane who got Tom Doday? And again, we're looking at not just a one-year cycle. Getting Tom Doday is still a good player. So oh, they're almost between these two categories, I think. I'll probably say C. Honestly, it wasn't massively impactful. Darren Fisher go out and Hollands comes in and they take two picks to the draft. I think it was decent without being necessarily really good. So let's get to Collingwood here. This is probably the first real juicy one to discuss. So we know that they gave away Taylor Adams for pick 33. Um, that's not a bad result all in all. I know that they took the two picks to the draft. They took Demetia and Togiath. Again, separating that, but still just outlining what essentially they took at the draft. So this is where it gets more interesting. Okay, so we know that they gave their future first round selection to Fremantle for Lockie Schultz. I'd actually forgotten they also gave away pick 33 in that deal, 34 rather, um, which, you know, Fremantle may have kept. I think Cooper Simpson was taken around that range, but either way, that's that ended up being pick 11. And look, Schultz, you know, statistically wasn't awful this year. In, against previous seasons, I think he averaged a little bit less disposals, more tackles this year, averaged about a goal a game. I'd say, you know, maybe he was a little bit overly maligned, but probably didn't give Collingwood the value that you'd think pick 11 would be. So that's kind of, now that we've had a year to reflect on that, that, that deal has not looked good at the moment. And uh, at the moment as well, uh, Fremantle will be very happy they did that deal, I reckon. We'll save that for later in this video. But this is also the Jack Endervin deal. So they got pick 33, they swapped future seconds and gave up pick 39. So 33 became 39. They swapped future seconds, which ended up being in Hawthorne's favor because Collingwood ended up finishing lower and future third round pick for a future fourth round pick. Look, Ginevan had an outstanding year. And, you know, from what I remember, keeping Jack Ginevan was probably still an option for Collingwood. It kind of happened late 
from memory there and he's had an outstanding season. I think you have to give Collingwood a D for this. It's not just that in isolation. It's the Lockie Schultz outcome here as well. Now, Schultz, if he's a premiership player in 12 months, they're not going to give a shit about this trade, I'd say. However, if we're isolating it on the outcomes of this trade period, I think Collingwood go into the D category for me. Essendon, this one is interesting as well because they were very active. So they've got Goldstein as an unrestricted free agent. They've got Ben Mackay as a restricted free agent. They've got Jade Gresham as a restricted free agent. So that's three players there that are essentially best 22, um, bearing in mind Goldstein is right at the end of his career. Um, while none of them are outstanding, they also didn't give up anything for those players. So we, we need to bear that in mind for a start. Uh, this looks like a pick swap. Again, that's probably a little bit messy. It's probably worth more analyzing uh, for the draft videos, particularly when we're not talking about first rounders. This is where what hurts them though. They gave away Massimo D'Ambrosio, who ended up having an unbelievable season. So that hurts. That hurts Essendon, to be honest. Was he keepable? I'd imagine so. I'd imagine so. I don't necessarily think he was demanding to get to Hawthorne and Essendon couldn't do anything about it and fought really hard to keep him. I don't think that's the case. Dersma and Zerk Thatcher is an interesting one here. Bearing in mind, Essendon did get Mackay out of Zerk Thatcher. Dersma had his moments this year without necessarily being outstanding. So how do we rate that? I think it was pretty good business to get in Dersma, Gresham, Mackay and Goldstein for the cost of essentially Zerk Thatcher and some later picks. That's, that's good business. And then it's heavily mitigated by the fact that Massimo D'Ambrosio became an outstanding player at Hawthorne this year. I think it's also a fair question to ask. Would Massimo D'Ambrosio have had the season he did this year had he stayed on Essendon's list? I'm not convinced by that. I think Hawthorne's system allowing D'Ambrosio to play the way he did is a huge factor in him having a great season. Not taking anything away from him. I'm just saying sometimes you go to a team that is playing cohesively and of course it brings out the best in you. So again, that's a really tough one to manage. You also bear in mind it was pick 61 on a future fourth. So Amazing value there for the Hawks. While Essendon did get four players in, none of them have been outstanding. Um, I think Goldstein really added something. Ben Mackay was an interesting one to assess as well. I think he frustrated some fans, but was still fourth in the league for intercepts and probably still a move that needed to make, albeit a lot of discussion was made about you know, North getting pick three for it. So if we ignore that for a minute, how do we reflect on this one year on? Bearing in mind, they still had their picks at the draft. They still got Nate Caddy. They didn't trade out of the draft as well. And I know we say we separate draft, but had they traded out of the draft um, and landed these players, it would weigh into it for sure. The D'Ambrosio one is a really interesting variable in this because I think I would have given Essendon a B, but do we drop them down to C because D'Ambrosio ended up being the best player to switch clubs out of that whole mix there. And uh, he left for an absolute pittance. I'm gonna say probably a C for Essendon. Um, had they meaningfully moved their list forward with that trade period, I'd be a bit more generous, but at the moment there just isn't enough value in to mitigate the loss of D'Ambrosio. Let me know in the comments what you think about that. Now we've got Fremantle, this is an interesting one. So these are pick swaps. They didn't trade anyone in, but they lost Lockie Shaws and Liam Henry, but they'll start with a pick swap. They got Port Adelaide's future first round pick, which is pick 18 that they currently hold, which is likely gonna feature as part of the Shea Bolton deal. I say that recording this uh, on Tuesday, meaning if the deal is done by the time you watch this, don't think I've just missed it. Uh, they gave away pick 23 and a future second round. So Port Adelaide was trying to accumulate pick to satisfy a deal for Sava. So that's separate to this, but they got Port Adelaide's future first, which is very interesting. And I think, you know, if it's part of a Shea Bolton deal, that's a decent start here. Collingwood's future first round pick uh, for Lockie Shules. We talked about that. So pick 11 and 18. They gave away pick 23, a future second, and Lockie Shules for Shea Bolton, essentially. I know that's kind of mixing in this year's trade period, but we're trying to get a feel for what value the, the picks ended up being, and we're pretty far along in the Shea Bolton deal that we can suggest that that's a damn good result for Fremantle. Um, what about Liam Henry here? This is one where probably I thought they'd get a little bit more for him, more based on the fact that Fremantle usually are quite hard traders. Um, anyway, St Kilda's future second round pick and a future fourth got to Fremantle uh, for a future fourth. So essentially a future second round pick. Look, it would be nice to keep Liam Henry. I think he's a good player. Uh, same thing with Lockie Schultz, but I think the outcomes of this Fremantle's minimum a B for me. Um, did their best 22 get weaker? Probably a little bit, but it, it might eventuate in Shea Bolton for a start and potentially also part of a Chad Warner bid in 2025 because they might flip one of their first currently for a future first. So it's getting a little bit messy here, but Fremantle probably 
would be very happy of the outcome. I might put them in A. Uh, Geelong didn't do a whole lot here. They got 25 for Asaba and 76 and 94. I reckon this pick ended up becoming Mitch Edwards. And look, I don't think Geelong will be too upset about this. I'm going to probably put them in C. You know, they were hardly active this particular year. Um, there's a few teams in C there. Do we, I think Essendon move up to B? I suppose given that particularly Dersma and Gresham, like over the next few years, can still add some value. And Mackay, maybe maybe we go S and B here because these players still have the opportunity to improve the team over time. Whereas with, like I just gave the Lions a B for Tom Dodo, who didn't play a game. So I'm going to say S and N, even with the D'Ambrosio loss, probably, you know, they should probably be a step up from Geelong who just lost a player for pick 25. Gold Coast, um, this was massive. Basically, we just saw them get a lot of pick swaps here. Um, we don't need to go through all of them, but essentially, you know, they just accumulated a heap of points. Picks 10, 17, and a future first from the Bulldogs. Um, and that is also going to be, you know, heavily traded for again this year. They traded 14, 27, and 35 to them for Melbourne's pick 11. That's just outstanding value. Did pick swap with Adelaide like we talked about. They've got North Melbourne's uh, end of first round assistance pick. What does it really cost them? It's cost them Elijah Hollands and Marbior Chol as players in that team, and Burgess, of course. And, you know, they picked up four first-round academy picks last year. Again, are we giving them credit, or are we just rating this on the outcome? I think, given Gold Coast are in a really strong position again this year to trade into next year for their academy picks, I think Gold Coast go in the A category. Would you agree with that? Um, that's an outstanding outcome. It was made easy for them with their academy to some extent, but in terms of extracting value out of those deals, um, you can't really say anything other than an A for Gold Coast. Next, we're at the Giants, and uh, they just lost Matthew Flynn, basically. I think that's it. So I'm probably just going to put them in C. I don't think they miss Matthew Flynn, but pick 40 isn't necessarily juicy. Um, it's interesting that they nearly got Fantasia. I forgot about that. But let's just move the Giants into C. So a little bit of inactivity from a few clubs in a row there. Let's talk about Hawthorne. This one is probably going to be an A, and I haven't even fully unpacked it yet. But gave away Tyler Brockman for pick 44. To be honest, that's looking like a win already. Uh, Jack Ginevan, obviously we talked about that, how that was really flipped in Hawthorne's favor, and he's become an outstanding player. So we don't need to rehash that. But you'd have to say they did very well there. Pick 49 for Kaczynski, probably didn't miss him too much this year. That's a bit of a nothing result, really. They got Dunstan back, who's played a big role, I think, with Cole Shadir and, you know, returning to that club. How much do they miss Brandon Ryan? Um, I suppose it'll tell over time if Brandon Ryan becomes a gun. But for what we know right now, it doesn't really change too much. Chol for a future second round pick and D'Ambrosio for pick 61 and a future fourth. What, a, what an amazing trade period to get Ginevan and D'Ambrosio in particular, get Gunston back, Chol back for a little bit of structure, lose Brandon Ryan, Tyler Brockman. This is clearly an A. Hawthorne really smashed it and it really springboarded a fantastic season. Demons will be interesting as well here. So they lost James Jordan as a free agency pick for pick 39. They didn't take a pick in that uh, range. They ended up trading a lot up uh, to get into six and 11. They go, gave away harms for a future third. Um, they also did this weird swap with the Gold Coast. So I think that's worth you know questioning why Melbourne traded 14, 27, and 35 from pick 11 for the Gold Coast Suns. You know, okay, so that trading up actually got them Tholstra. We don't know whether they needed to do that. And was it really worth trading out of 27 and 35? When you consider 14 could have got them Darcy Wilson. Again, separating trade and draft, but I don't, I don't like this. I don't know what Melbourne were thinking there. Gave away Brody Grundy for a future second. You know, on that was a power of value. Uh, it's hard to mark them harshly, even though Grundy had a good year and exceeded that. He wasn't worth more than that at the time, so it probably stopped short of criticism there. Fullerton didn't play a game for them year, this year. McAdam got injured. Billings was a fringe player. I mean, he played a fair amount of footy, subbed on and off a lot. Um, you know, not bad considering it was just a free agency move. So what do we make of all that? I suppose it's worth considering they held on to Petty, they held firm there. So essentially, what are we talking about there? We got Harms out, we got Grundy out, we got Fullerton, McAdam, and Billings in. Not a whole lot going on there for the for the Demons. And uh, this one here also, like I said, I'm not sure about it. Oh, James Jordan here is another player worth mentioning as an out. Oh, I, don't, I don't particularly like it. I don't think there's a whole lot 
really to bang on about and a bit of bad luck here with McAdam uh, being injured. It's probably more out than in, to be honest, but I'm probably going to give it a C because we're not talking huge margins here. We're not talking high profile players. So Melbourne again, get a C. I don't love it, but I do kind of like their attack on the draft in recent years, which will continue this year. So North Melbourne's an interesting one. Again, it's not really something to give them credit for getting pick three for Ben Mackay. But like I said, if we're considering outcomes here more than the effort, then that's a really good start, to be honest. And while I do need a key back, pick three for Ben Mackay, you do that every day of the week. So the, part of their strategy was, obviously they got some assistance packages, uh, picks rather, and they wanted to get some mature players, Dylan Stevens and Zach Fisher. I think Fisher was probably a bit more important than Stevens this year from the outside looking in. And they did, you know, a bunch of swaps without going into all, all of it. They ended up with five picks, I think, in the top 17, which I think became the top 23 or something like that. Obviously, there was a bit of a chance they were going to uh, stump up an offer for pick one uh, to West Coast, but they didn't, and they took their five picks. I think they drafted well as an aside, but we're really talking about the moves made prior to the draft. Pick 18, yeah, I think they did some smart moves trading their future picks because those priority picks were... Um, conditional, so it will not conditional, but the AFL could have taken them away from them. But if they traded them to another club, the AFL couldn't do that. They were pretty smart with the way they went about things. And uh, you've got here, Toby Pink as a delisted free agent added some value too. I think on outcomes, okay, they lost Mackay and they lost Goldstein and some valuable experience. But as we know now, 12 months on, they're not having too much trouble trading back in, you know, some experienced players. Logue is also fit again, so that works against the Mackay um, loss, and Toby Pink was okay this year as well. So I think we're going to give them an A. I think they, they hit the draft and nailed the draft last year, which was set up by some shrewd moves that we just went through. So I'm going to put North Melbourne in the A category. Now we've got Port Adelaide here. This is an interesting one because... Um, they did that pick swap with Fremantle. So they traded a future first round pick here and they got 23 and a future second. And the point of this was to get picks in that year's draft to satisfy Geelong for a Sava. They also went for Ivan Soldo, Ivan Soldo rather, and gave away uh, you know a bunch of picks later. That hasn't really worked out. He's requested a trade to St Kilda and um, you know they got Jordan Sweet as well, so I suppose that's a pretty good move for pick 50, considering now they're losing Soldo. It's good that they got both. Had they not got both, Soldo might still be at Port Adelaide there. Either way, that, that one's a bit murky. Like, I don't think that was handled particularly well, perhaps, you know, or maybe just the strategy at the time didn't make sense, and sure enough, it hasn't worked out. Uh, Isava Radagalia to Geelong. Now, he was a best 22 player. And I suppose pick 25 is decent value for him. And they gave up Dersma for Zerk Thatcher here. So this is there's quite a lot going on here for Port Adelaide. When you consider that their first round pick in this year's draft, which is pick 18 that belongs to Fremantle, that essentially got them Asava Radagalia, because that was what they got from Fremantle, if I'm not mistaken. It was originally tied to North. So they, it got them Asava Radagalia and a bit of Ivan Solo, or the primary piece, because that future second round pick went to Fremantle. So pick 18 for Ivan Soldo and Asava Radagalia. That was a huge part of this trade period. And then you separate Sweet, pick 50, and you separate Zerk Thatcher for Dersma. I don't really love it, to be honest. I suppose at the end of the day, they got their man in Asava, but considering it cost them basically a first round pick for him in Soldo, that's becoming a little bit stinky for them. Sure, they got some important pieces. And at the end of the day, they did contend, right? Uh, maybe I should bear that in mind as well. They were a team in contention and they did need a key back. And the Sava probably was fairly important to them. Had they just gone to this year with, say, Tom, Todd Cleary or whoever else, I'm not too sure. I suppose we need to, to weight that into it. Dersma was decent. Um, I'm sure they don't really regret trading Dersma, having Zert Thatcher and Asava. Like I said, there, there really was a need for a key back as there was a, a need for a Ruckman. So do we go B for Port Adelaide? I, may, I actually thought I was going to be harsher on them than that. But I think at the end of the day, what the outcomes were that they got a best 22 player in a year where they were pushing for the premiership and got all the way to a prelim. They might get their access back in this draft anyway through Dan Houston leaving, although he probably wouldn't give them credit for that. It's not an ideal outcome, but I think... I think you got to give the power a B for that. And, and Soldo, I know that trade hasn't worked out, but... 
all in all, PK-18 for a Sava. Oh, it's a bit gross, but it's probably aligned with what their aims are as a football club. Richmond were pretty inactive. I think this is on the back of them trading out picks for Hopper and Taranto, right? So they had no draft picks, really. Gave away Big and Yuan. I don't think he... I think he's been delisted from North Melbourne, so that's really not worth looking at too hard. Gave away Soldo. They have Nankervis. Probably not a, a big deal there. They got a future second from Fremantle for that. And that's part of a big tra- um, draft strategy that they've got this year. They also got Kaczynski from Hawthorne. Um, I don't think he's had an amazing year. I can't remember. I think he played about half a season. Either way, a pretty low-cost deal. So there's actually not a lot here to go through with Richmond. However, it's worth noting that these deals, and this is one of them, where they got uh, future picks from Port Adelaide and Fremantle, and they did another live trade with West Coast, and there may be someone else I'm missing, led to this current strategy of Richmond having heaps of picks in this year's draft, which they can use to trade with Gold Coast, to trade with Brisbane, to improve their draft hand this year. So to be honest, given that they had nothing really going on in this year's draft, they did have one eye on the 2024 draft. Am I going to give them a B for this? I actually think that, again, it's, it's hard to assess because we haven't had the 24 trade period in its entirety yet. So to what extent can they leverage the picks that they traded for in this year's draft? I'm actually going to be generous with Richmond. I think it's a B. I know that sounds wild because that on paper wasn't much going on. But there was a long-term view with Richmond having a lot of picks in this this year's draft. And if they can execute this, which they haven't done yet at the time of recording this, it will lead to a massive draft haul for a team that they had their hands tied by the previous trade periods, which we have to separate. St Kilda is an interesting one here. They got a pick 21 for Jay Gresham. That's probably reasonable value, to be honest, even if you know that was out of their hands. They got Liam Henry. I do like that they held firm on this and only gave a future second round pick for Liam Henry. Fremantle are pretty hard to trade with, and I actually mean that respectfully, like a bit of a compliment. Um, and St Kilda held their stance and a future second round pick for Liam Henry, I think is a good deal. So that's a good start in general. Paddy Dow for a bunch of pick swaps. So we'll say Dow and... Caulfield switched spots and they gave away Jack Billings as a free agent again, right? Oh no, that's a trade. Future third round pick for Jack Billings. So they they cleaned up their list a little bit. They got Henry in, um, again, separating the trade and the draft. I think that's B for St. Kilda. We're not talking about some big moves here. And, um, you know, I thought maybe losing Gresham would hurt. He, He has been a good player at times in his career, but they also got Liam Henry who I do think is still a worthwhile talent for sure. I'm going to give them a B. I think it certainly exceeds a C without actually necessarily being all the way in A. Sydney, they signed two unrestricted free agents, Joel Hamling and James Jordan. Joel, James Jordan had was an important player this year. I'd say he added value considering zero cost. Joel Hamling didn't play a game, if I'm not mistaken. They gave away Dylan Stevens, and uh, they that cost them pick 25, but now they hold a first-round pick from North Melbourne or an end-of-first-round pick, um, that was originally North Melbourne's priority assistance pick. They might use those to move up the draft order this year. It's unclear. However, they did also give up a future second round pick for Grundy. Again, that's a pretty good deal, actually. So I, I think this is actually a bit of a win here for Sydney so far. The only slight misfire on value, you could say, Taylor Adams for pick 33. Considering his age and the fact that you know he was in and out of the team this year, didn't play in the grand final, you could be critical on that one. On the other hand, Sydney also had an academy player last year and they got that academy player, Caden Cleary, in the second round anyway. So to what extent would this have been realistically used? I think it was worth a gamble. Do we go as high as A for Sydney? I think so. Brody Grundy was an important player. James Jordan added value. At the end of the day, they still took a first round pick in Will Green. They still got a second rounder in Caden Cleary. I think this is a bit of a slam dunk for Sydney here, even if they didn't get a whole lot from Hamling and they got a bit out of Adams, but probably not as much as forecasted. I'm going to say the Sydney Swans get an A. And like I said about Hawthorne, that springboarded a very good season. Not a lot here going on for the West Coast Eagles. Uh, The biggest trade story that was talked about with them last year was a a potential swap for Harley Reid, which ended up not happening. So let's just talk about Matthew Flynn, unrestricted free agent, and Tyler Brockman, 44 and 33. Flynn did a hammy, came back into the team mid-year and then dropped out again. Um, Then there's Tyler Brockman who also came over and got dropped um, and added tiny little bits of value here and there. Again, this is a longer term play. These guys are like 22 and 25 and were positions of need. Certainly Matt Flynn was needed 
as a ruckman. So it's actually too hard to tell here with West Coast, even if there's not a lot going on. But not a lot went out either. So I think that they're just the stock standard C. And finally, the Western Bulldogs. This is an interesting one because this was a real doozy. They got picks 4, 46, and 51. They gave away 10, 17, and a future first round pick, which I think is uh, the current... Gold Coast pick 13, which everyone's clamoring for by the time I'm recording this. I don't know if it has a home by then. 10, 17 in a future first for four is, is a pretty generous deal. On the other hand, there's some context here where the Bulldogs had Jordan Croft, a father-son, who ended up getting bid on, I reckon, 15. And so there was some doubt around these picks and whether both of them or one of them would be absorbed by a bid for Jordan Croft at the time of the trade period. So they probably want to get out of this range. They got Riley Sanders. They still get their second first rounder. It's cost them a first round pick in this year's draft, but it did get them Riley Sanders. So that's the nuance here with the Western Bulldogs. This is an interesting move. I actually think Riley Sanders will be a very good footballer. And Jordan Croft, I know less about, but at the end of the day, still getting the young talent in. James Harms, uh, I think he played like eight games for the Bulldogs this year, but future third round pick is a bit of a pittance. Coffield played around similar eight games, I think, for, for the Bulldogs. I'm not sure exactly on the numbers there. And still young enough where he could add some value. I actually don't know if he's out of contract. And the other one was giving away Jordan Sweets. Um, yeah, again, not massively valuable. So all of all, how do we rate that? Do we say, you know, Harms and Coffield probably bolster the middle part of their list they're kind of low cost, low reward a little bit. I mean, Harms at his best for Melbourne has been pretty good. So maybe that was a bit disrespectful. Harms could be a good player. Coffield was a high draft pick that just keeps getting injured. So it's a little bit harder to assess. I suppose it really lives and dies by this trade here, in my opinion. The thing is as well, the Bulldogs have a lot of good tools. They probably really needed a midfielder and getting the Lark medalist last year in Riley Sanders might have been worth trading out. So if we simplify it as 10 in a future first round pick, which is probably, it's pick 13. So 10 and 13 for four, it's probably about right on value, to be honest. But like I said, they also still got Jordan Croft. Uh, I, think, I think I'll give them a B because it was good. I like the strategy of what they did, but we also can't pretend they didn't pay a decent price for it. Had they paid a little bit less, it might be A, but I, I do think that will pay off long-term. And the other lower cost trades that they did, probably a little bit more speculative still. Anyway, guys, that is the end of the video. Um, it took ages, but I didn't expect it to go that long, but let me know in the comments what you agree with and disagree with. This is actually harder. I didn't really map it out before I started it. I was kind of spitballing there. So let me know what you agree with and disagree with, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.